G'day folks, welcome back to the channel. In this episode, we continue our journey along the Hillbilly Highway. Leaving the 20 creeks behind, we push on to Barrington Tops and beyond to finish day one at Norrit Flat. Along the way, we will hear news articles from back in the day regarding the discovery and development of this part of the land. So stick around and enjoy the journey. That's the first part of today's excitement over and done with. Down through the 20 creeks. Had a couple of really sketchy crossings on a couple of them. One I swear I was going to lose or I ended up on the side of the road, up in the, up in the grass. That was a lot of fun. But I made it through. Didn't drop the bike. Which I'm really, really happy about. James had a couple of dodgy crossings as well. Just the big boulders in there, bouncing them off and throwing your bike all over the place. Yeah, great fun. Looks like they're getting ready to pave this. A dish drain going in on the side there. From the early 1900s onwards, people were travelling to Barrington Tops to enjoy the cool climate, especially in the warmer months. But the journey to the Tops was made more difficult due to there being no road. From the Scone Advocate, Friday 31st January 1908. As we are just now experiencing some delightfully warm weather, it may not be out of place to give you a brief description of the Barrington Tops, an ideal summer resort not more than 45 miles from Scone. For the first 35 miles of the journey, from Scone to Stewart's Brook, the road is very good for riding or driving, but from there onwards the journey has to be done on horseback. Now for the departure from Stewart's Brook. Packing all the provisions and blankets on pack horses, for both of these are very necessary commodities on the tops. You follow along the north arm of the brook for about four miles, then you commence the climb up the mountain. It is certainly very steep in parts, and to those not used to riding in rough country would appear almost impracticable. But with a reliable horse there is nothing to fear. Feet got pretty wet going across the 20 creeks. It's hard to sort of keep your feet up. I sort of felt like I needed to keep them on the pegs to keep the balance up. Look at that. Fabulous. like to try and stand up when I go across a cattle grid. It just gives me a little bit more perspective, a little bit more height. You can sort of see what's coming up, if there's any potholes or ruts on the other side. I think it's a good practice to get into or generally try and do it. Just helps you see, helps you pick your line. Now here 
here we are at the Dingo Gate. Thank you. In the early days of European settlement, dingoes were a big problem for the sheep and cattle graziers of the district. The dingo gate and adjoining fence line were erected at the border of the park in order to keep dingoes from the east out of the pasture lands to the west. Certainly a lot cooler up here. Just in the last couple of minutes I've noticed the change in the temperature. The change to a cooler atmosphere is quite perceptible even at this stage of the journey. From here onwards it is all climbing till you reach the top, where there is a trig station, more often called the landmark. From here you have a very extensive view in the directions of Cassilis and Murrurundi, showing range after range of mountains. It is difficult to find fitting terms in which to describe the scenery. In the afternoon, as the shadows of the slopes around begin to lengthen on the plain, it presents a picture which for effects of light and shade and colouring could not be surpassed. And then at sunset, when there is a purplish haze encircling the hills and the sky is tinted with the most delicate shades of pink and blue and gold, the landscape is simply perfect. But the most marvellous sight is the view from Carey's Peak, a point on the sheer edge of the tablelands overlooking the valleys of the Patterson, the Williams and the Allen Rivers. When you consider the height above sea level, 5,000 feet, you are surprised to find such a constant flow of water in numerous little streams that unite and form the head of the Barrington River. The water is exceptionally clear and soft. In fact, the purity of its water is one of the most notable facts about the tops. The other is the beautiful climate. In the hottest part of summer, the air is delightfully cool and fresh and is known to be remarkably healthy. If the government only took it in hands and built a hydro on the tops, where people could spend the hottest part of summer and thus escape the sweltering heat we experience on the lower country, it would be a great boon. This place has only to be known to be appreciated as a delightful summer resort, and in the meantime, until the hydro is an accomplished fact, should prove a great attraction to camping out parties. Scone Advocate, Friday 8th of June, 1923. Adjoining the tops is the well-known no man's land between the Tamala and Barrington. It is full of cedars, and at one place the cliffs are 200 feet of perpendicular rock in the formation of a round hole about five miles wide, and this is known as the Devil's Hole, into which only two white men have ever been known to descend. Here we are, folks, at uh, Devil's Hole Lookout. Here's James. He's checking his Facebook. Say to you, James. That's it. Scrolling. <laughs> scrolling. Always scrolling. Never know what you're going to find. I'm checking the distance where we have to go. Yeah, nice. It's a pretty nice view out there. You can see forever.
After taking in the view at the lookout, as well as having a bite to eat, it was time to push on and make our way across the tops and down the other side. From the Maitland Daily Mercury, Tuesday, 26th of February, 1929. A special motor camping expedition is being organized to Barrington Tops at Easter. Arrangements have been entered into with Mr. L. Cavalier of Newcastle, who has conducted numerous parties to the Tops from time to time, by which the outing will be organized and the various creek crossings made trafficable. Although the roads have improved greatly from those days of the past, it's still important to take care when driving or riding through the bush, as you're about to see. I don't know if the camera picked that up or not, but there was a, uh, a ute gone over the side there where that tape was. Obviously lost control and over the edge. Hopefully they're okay. It should take some, some effort to get that out of there. It wasn't all that far in, but still was on a fairly steep angle. Not really the sort of place you want to be going off-road on in any vehicle. In December 1863, the bush ranger Captain Thunderbolt, whose real name was Frederick Ward, held up the toll bar between Maitland and Rutherford. In the following weeks, he travelled around the district, always staying one step ahead of the law. In February 1864, he made his way through Rawdon Vale as he returned to the New England district to continue his activities. The following is an account of his escape. From the Maitland Mercury, 
Tuesday, 23rd February, 1864, Ward, the Bush Ranger, close pursuit and escape. This worthy, who for several weeks past has been holding the residents of the Upper Williams in awe, has at last managed to effect his escape from that locality. Foiled in his attempts to pass the almost impassable mountains dividing the waters of the Williams and Manning, he must have returned almost to Dungog, following the bush tracks from there unto near Gloucester, where he was first seen, and the authorities in Stroud at once communicated with him. Constables Cox and Finley started in pursuit. In the meantime, Ward had proceeded up the Gloucester and Barrington rivers, and was last heard of at the Rodden Vale station, inquiring the way to the adjoining station, and evidently making his way to the Upper Hunter, or Hanging Rock. This was late on the evening of the 8th, and on the evening of the 9th, Messrs. Cox and Findlay arrived there in hot haste from Stroud, a distance of 52 miles, to find that they must be but one short day's ride behind, but behind, nevertheless. Nothing daunted by as heavy a fall of rain as your correspondent has seen for some years, and in the face of rapidly rising rivers, they again started in pursuit, over a road of which it may be said there could hardly be a worse, but alas, the very elements had taken the miscreant's part, and our two worthy members of the police force, after most praiseworthy efforts, found that they had but crossed one river to be detained by the next, and for three days had no option to advance or return. Doubtless by that time Ward was out of reach from this side. When last seen he was tolerably well mounted, having two horses, but no saddle. In the late 1860s, gold was discovered in the area between Barrington Tops and Gloucester, with many claims being established. From then until the very early 1900s, men flocked to the district in the hopes of striking it rich. From the Maitland Mercury, Tuesday 27th of June, 1876, the Barrington River Gold Fields. In addition to the information published elsewhere, we have received the following particulars from our Stroud correspondent. Good accounts from the above gold fields continue to reach us almost daily. On Tuesday last, a fine nugget weighing some seven ounces, three grains was unearthed, and many others of smaller dimensions continue to be spoken of. One of our storekeepers has dispatched a load of rations to supply their wants, and some three or four butchering licenses have been taken out. Reports say there are 60 men on the ground, others say 100 and today we were told there were 200 and plenty on the road. From the Sydney Morning Herald, Monday, 13th of January, 1879, Gloucester, Saturday. The Back Creek New Year's gift claim, a new discovery, shows gold freely in quartz. At River Cobar Cook Station, a reef has been discovered by Jackson. It promises well, and is reported to yield four ounces to the ton. The load is four feet and cropping out. Five leases have been taken up. From the Dungog Chronicle, Friday 25th May, 1894, the Great Cobart Gold Mining Company will about Wednesday next complete a crushing of over 100 tons of stone. Various other claims have between them over 300 tons to put through after the proprietors of the battery have cleaned up. A new reef has been opened by Saxby and Party on the Barrington River situated between Moppy and Bernal. The reef is about 12 inches thick showing very fair gold. There is several tons already at grass. 
which will be taken to Cobark for treatment as soon as the mill will be available. The shadows were lengthening as we made our way towards Gloucester, still another 35 kilometres away. After refuelling, it was yet another 50 kilometres to Norrit Flat and our camp for the night. I usually enjoyed the section along Bunduk Road, where the sun was low in the sky and made seeing the way difficult at times. Finally, we arrived at Night Flat Riverside Camp with about 30 minutes to spare before sundown, so we quickly got the tent set up and went about getting some much needed food into our bellies. Here's James having his second dinner. What do you got for second dinner, James? Oh, just a bit of pasta and chicken and corn. Nice. And, uh, I reckon a bit of chili with it. Ooh, very good. And what'd you have for first dinner? A bit of a uh, ravioli. Oh, very nice. With uh, pasta as well. Yep. Scrumptious. Uh, yep. And I had. Uh, Chicken with, um, pa well actually pasta, with chicken and corn. And uh, that certainly hit the spot after a big day on the road. So we're just here at Norrit Flat, just kicking back, enjoying the campfire. Uh, a few stars out in the sky. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a cool night though, it's starting to dew up a bit. But anyway, we're having fun, kicking back. And um, we'll see you in the morning. Join us next time as we wrap up this series when we ride the most challenging section of the Hillbilly Highway.